Hey guys, GameZack here and welcome to another one of my Civilization 6 videos. Now, with Civ 6 releasing and all 19 civilizations being officially revealed, I want to look through all the civs because I'm trying to figure out which one I want to play first. So first up, civilizations in Civ 6 are made up of four distinct properties. They are a leader bonus, which is tied to the leader's time period, a civ bonus, which is a permanent ability that lasts throughout the game, the unique unit, which usually replaces an existing unit with a better one, but sometimes it's a unit on its own. There's the unique infrastructure, which is a district, a building in a district, or a tile improvement unique to that sieve. And technically there is the fifth property, which is the leader agenda if you're playing with the AI. Now, not all the agendas are 100% clear at this point, so I'll talk about them where I can, though it has been stated that the Civ's AI's primary agenda would be in tune with their intended playstyles, so generally they'll be playing their advantages. Also, it has been said that additional leaders may be introduced later on, so one Civ might have a few leaders to choose from in the future. Alright, there are 19 Civs and I'm going to go in alphabetical order, so let's get started. So first up is the American Empire, with their leader Teddy Roosevelt. The leader bonus is the Roosevelt Corollary. Where units receive a combat strength bonus on their home continent, bonus appeal to all tiles in a city with a national park, and you gain the Rough Rider unique unit that's unlocked with rifling. The permanent civilization bonus is the Founding Fathers. All government legacy bonuses are earned in half the time as usual. You get the P-51 Mustang as a unique unit, which is a fighter aircraft. And the unique infrastructure is the Film Studio Building, which replaces the Broadcast Tower, built in the Theatre Square, and it boosts tourism in the modern era. And we do know Teddy has the Big Stick Agenda, which likes peaceful civilizations on his home continent, and hates civilizations that start wars on his home continent. So where America really does come into play is after the industrial era, the mid to late game, and going for a cultural victory with film studios and national parks is definitely viable. Basically the way I see playing America is you go with the flow at the start of the game and then surge culture later on. Next up is the Arabian Empire with Saladin as their leader. Saladin's bonus is Righteousness of the Faith, which means the worship building for Arabia's chosen religion costs less and produces bonus science, faith and culture. The permanent civilization bonus is the last profit where Arabia will automatically receive the last available great profit if they haven't founded their own religion already. The Mamluk is the unique unit which is a replacement for the knight and heals at the end of every turn even if it's moved or attacked. And the Madrasa building is the unique infrastructure which replaces the university in the campus district and provides bonus faith and more science. Now Arabia seems very much like a mid-game sieve and easily going for a science or religious victory because you get various faith bonuses, and to ensure that your Civ isn't left behind, you do get some science bonuses too. The way I see playing Arabia is going religion early, but don't sacrifice anything to push religion because you're guaranteed a great profit regardless. Next we have the Aztec Empire with Montezuma as their leader. The leader bonus here is gifts for the Tlatloani, which means luxury resources in his territory provide an amenity to two extra cities, and military units receive bonus combat strength for each different luxury resource improved in Aztec lands. The permanent civilization bonus is Legend of the Five Sons, where you can spend your builder charges to speed district construction. The Eagle Warrior is the unique unit here, which replaces the basic warrior at the start of the game, and converts defeated enemies into builders. But it only works against other civilizations, not barbarians. And the Trachli building is the unique infrastructure, giving amenities, faith, and great general points, and replaces the arena in the entertainment complex. And we know Montezuma's agenda is Tlatoani, which likes civilizations that have the same luxury resources as he does and he'll try to collect every luxury resource available. He also dislikes civilizations who have a new luxury resource that Montezuma does not have. So I do have to say first of all that the Aztecs is the pre-order bonus civilization, which you'll only be able to play for the first 90 days of the game's release if you pre-order the game. After the 90 days, everyone who owns the game will get the Aztecs for free. Now, the way I see playing Aztecs is very much an early game Civ. War and growth are tied together, and they can easily go for a domination victory. I see using early wars to grow your civilization to a strong point to powerhouse through the mid and late game. Then we have the Brazilian Empire with Pedro II. 
The leader bonus here is magnanimous, which means after you get a great person, 20% of the great person points are refunded. The permanent civilization bonus is Amazon, where rainforest tiles provide extra adjacency bonuses for campus, commercial hubs, holy sites, and theater square districts, and extra housing for neighborhoods built next to them. Minas Gerais is a unique unit here, replacement for the battleship, but it's available earlier on, and it's actually unlocked with the nationalism civic rather than a technology. And the unique infrastructure is the Street Carnival District, which allows you to build the Carnival Project, which basically converts that city's production into amenities to keep people happy. So playing Brazil is very much a flexible, go with the flow civilization. You can take advantage of rainforest, definitely, and focus on great people, but that pretty much opens up any type of playstyle or victory type. So if you're playing Brazil, do basically what you want, but make sure you're focusing on great people because that's where their powers really come in. Which great people? Well, that's up to you. And then we've got the Chinese Empire with Qin Shi Huang. His leader bonus is the First Emperor, which means when building ancient and classical wonders, you may speed their construction with builders, and his builders get an additional charge. The permanent civilization bonus is Dynastic Cycle, which means Eurekas and Inspirations provide 60% rather than 50% boosts, and the Crouching Tiger Cannon is their unique unit, a high-powered short-range unit and doesn't require a specific resource to produce. And their unique infrastructure is very special, where it's the Great Wall Improvement, which is a tile improvement, that you have to spend builders to construct each piece, but each piece gives bonuses to defense, gold, culture, and tourism that gets better with each additional segment, if it's on a hill and as you advance through the tech tree. Though it does need to be built on the edge of the empire, we also know that Qin Shi Huang's agenda is Wall of 10,000 Li, and basically dislikes anyone who builds more wonders than him. So China is very much an early to mid-game sieve, building early wonders, taking advantage of those builders, so it's a defensive sieve to get you boosted for a powerful later game. Grow a strong to medium empire really early on. Build lots of wonders and continue that momentum through the mid game to ensure that China is very solid and established, letting that great wall bonus build over time. Next up, we've got the Egyptian Empire under Cleopatra. Cleopatra's leader bonus is Mediterranean's Bride, where trade routes to other civilizations provide extra gold for Egypt. Other civilizations' trade routes to Egypt provide extra food for them and gold for Egypt as well. The permanent civilization bonus is Iteru, where districts and wonders are built faster if placed adjacent to a river, and floodplains don't block placements of districts and wonders. The Marianu Chariot Archer is their unique unit and replaces the Heavy Chariot, receiving bonus movement when starting on open terrain. And the Sphinx Tile Improvement is their unique infrastructure. Sphinxes provide faith and culture and get bonuses when built adjacent to a wonder. And we know Cleopatra's agenda is Queen of the Nile, where Cleopatra will respect you if you have a strong military but despise someone who has a weak military. So Egypt is very much an early game sieve, focusing on economic plays, boosting faith and culture while you're at it. The way I see it is you play the growth game by making lots of money through trade and boosting faith and culture with wonders, expand to desert areas that other civs can't really use because of floodplains, and once your economy is super strong, you should be able to go through the mid and late game with plenty of momentum built up from early economy. Then we have the English Empire under Victoria. Victoria's leader bonus is Pax Britannica, where you get a free melee unit when settling on foreign continents. You also gain the Redcoat Unique Unit, that gains a bonus on fighting on foreign continents and can disembark without using a movement point. The permanent civilization bonus is the British Museum, where each archaeology museum holds six artifacts instead of three and can support two archaeologists at once. The Sea Dog is the English Unique Unit, replacing the Privateer, and can bully weaker units and can capture enemy ships. And the Royal Navy Dockyard District is a unique infrastructure for England, providing bonus movement for naval units built in it, a bonus gold for dockyards on other continents, and great admiral points. And we do know Victoria's agenda is sun never sets. Victoria wants to settle on every continent and will dislike civilizations on other continents. So England's looking like a mid to late game civ. Expansionist, definitely. Large navy, yes. Going for a culture victory with museums is definitely viable. And the way I see playing England is you grow your empire at a reasonable rate with a slight focus on culture until you get up a strong navy and then start expanding all over the world. Getting those free melee units on new cities far away is definitely going to come in handy. So going for a domination or culture victory seems ideal. Next, we have the French Empire under Catherine de' Medici. The leader bonus here is Catherine's Flying Squadron, giving one level of diplomatic visibility greater than the normal with every civilization she's met. 
and you get to build an extra spy with the castle's technology. The permanent civilization bonus here is the Grand Tour, giving bonus production to medieval, renaissance, and industrial era wonders, and tourism from wonders of any era is doubled. The Guard Imperial is the unique unit here, receiving combat bonuses fighting on the home continent, and great general points from kills. And the Chateau Tile Improvement is a unique infrastructure here, which yields culture, must be built near a river, and gains bonuses from adjacent wonders. And we do know Catherine de' Medici's agenda is Black Queen, which is to gain as many spies and as much diplomatic access as possible, and does not like civilizations who ignore these espionage activities. So France is clearly a mid to late game civ, especially when spies come into play in the Renaissance. And obviously going for a culture victory with lots of culture bonuses is definitely a thing. The way I see playing France is focusing on culture early on, pushing you down the civic tree as fast as possible, and playing the diplomatic game of allying with other civs and trying to become suzerain of a number of city-states to help keep you safe, levying military in a pinch. Then we have the German Empire under Frederick Barbarossa. The leader bonus here is Holy Roman Emperor, where you get an additional military policy slot in your government, and bonus combat strength when attacking city-states. The permanent civilization bonus here is Free Imperial Cities, where you can build one more district than the population limit would allow. Usually it's one district per three pop, so Germany gets one more. The U-boat is the unique unit here, replacing the submarine, has lower production costs and receives combat bonus in deep ocean. And the Hansa district is the unique infrastructure for Germany. It's a replacement for the industrial zone, receiving bonus production if placed adjacent to a commercial hub, other districts, or resources. We also know Frederick Barbarossa's agenda is Iron Crown. Like civilizations who do not associate with city-states, does not like suzerains of any city-states, or civilizations who have conquered city-states. So basically he wants all city-states for himself and doesn't like anyone else who associates with them. So Germany is very much a mid to late game civ, production, focus, and a strong military throughout the game. The way I see playing Germany is to get a strong land military early on, and to stop others from benefiting from city-states that you aren't suzerain of while you grow your cities to powerhouses with more districts, later on using the U-boat in the late game to counter naval civs that got too far ahead. Next up we have the Greek Empire and the Pericles. The leader bonus here is Surrounded by Glory, where you get bonus culture for every city-state to which Greece is the suzerain of. The permanent civilization bonus is Plato's Republic, receiving an extra wildcard policy slot no matter which government is chosen. And the Hoplite is a unique unit here, which replaces the Spearman, gains a combat bonus when adjacent to other Hoplite units. And the Acropolis District replaces the Theater District as their unique infrastructure, gaining higher culture adjacency bonuses by being next to other districts, especially the city center, but must be built on a hill. We also know that Pericles' agenda is Delian League, where he likes civilizations that aren't competing for the same city-state allegiances, dislikes civilizations that are competing for that city-state. So Greece looks like a very much early game civ, being very culture-focused. And you especially want to focus culture because that extra policy slot means more civics means more policies that you can choose from. Unlike Germany, Greece wants to be friends with city-states, so probably won't get along well with Germany. And although you are very culture-focused, after the early game when hoplites get out of play, you're gonna need the city-states on your side so you can levy military to help keep you safe. Then we have the Indian Empire under Gandhi. The leader bonus here is Satyagraha, receiving faith boosts for each civilization you have met that has founded a religion and with whom you are not at war. Other civilizations suffer additional happiness penalties for warring against Gandhi. The permanent civilization bonus here is Dharma, receiving the benefits of all follower beliefs of religions present in your cities, not just the ones you have founded. And the Varu is a unique unit here replacing the horsemen, and it reduces the combat strength of adjacent enemy units. The Stepwell Improvement is a unique infrastructure here, providing food and housing, and gives bonus food if built adjacent to a farm, and bonus faith if built adjacent to a holy site. So India is looking like very much an early to mid-game civ, a religious victory definitely. Lots of faith and religious bonuses here. Though religious victory does need some military power for defense and to attack those civs that just won't convert, and the elephants here will help you with that. The way I see playing India is to grow your cities large and to go religion the whole game and maybe changing to a domination victory later on. Then we have the Japanese Empire under Hojo Tokimune. The leader bonus here is Divine Wind. Land and naval units receive bonus combat strength in tiles adjacent to coast and shallow water tiles. Building of encampments, holy sites, and theater square districts are halved. 
The permanent civilization bonus here is Meiji Restoration. All districts receive an additional standard adjacency bonuses for being adjacent to another district. And the samurai is the unique unit here, fighting as if they were at full strength until they are completely destroyed. And the electronics factory building is a unique infrastructure, replacing the normal factory, and provides a production bonus that's extended to all cities within six tiles. We also know that Hojo's agenda is Bushido, liking civilizations with a strong military but only if they are also strong in faith or culture. So Japan's looking like a mid to late game Civ, from the Samurais to the Electronics Factory, being very militaristic with coastal cities that are also very dense seems important. The way I see playing Japan is to expand to have a good number of efficient cities with lots of districts and to use the terrain to your advantage, and positioning your cities to take advantage of the electronics factory later on. Just lots of districts generally. Next up we've got the Congolese Empire under Mavemba Anazinga. His leader bonus is Religious Convert, where he can't build holy sites but he receives the founder belief benefits of any religion that has become the majority religion in that city. Also receiving a free apostle whenever an Mbanza or theater district is built. The permanent civilization bonus here is Nikisi, gaining bonus food, production and gold from each relic, artifact and great work of sculpture, and getting bonus great artist and great merchant points each turn. Nungao Mumbeba is a unique unit here, replacing the swordsman, receiving a bonus to range defense and does not require iron to build. Wood and rainforest do not slow them down or block sight. And Mbanza district is a unique infrastructure here, available earlier than the normal neighborhood, providing housing, food, and gold. We also know his agenda is enthusiastic disciple, liking civilizations that bring religion to the Congo, and dislikes civilizations that have founded a religion but not brought it to a Congolese city. So Congo is looking very much like an early game Civ, focusing on growth and culture, leaning towards a cultural victory but large cities are strong in any case. The way I see playing Congo is expanding aggressively with cities and military early on to get large well defended cities, setting you up for a strong mid to late game. Then we have the Norwegian Empire under Harald Hardrada, his leader bonus being Thunderbolt of the North providing the Viking longship unique unit that replaces the galley early on, and it heals in neutral territory. It's a melee naval unit and can perform coastal raids. The permanent civilization bonus here is the Nar, where units gain the ability to enter ocean tiles after researching shipbuilding, and units ignore the additional movement cost from embarking and disembarking. The Berserker is a unique unit of Norway, and it doesn't replace any other unit unit. It can pillage that costs one movement point, but gets bonus combat strength when attacking and minus combat strength when defending. The Stave Church building is a unique infrastructure, replacing the temple and gains additional faith adjacency bonuses from woods. We also know that Harald's agenda is Last Viking King to build a strong navy and respect civilizations who follow his lead. He does not like civilizations with a weak navy. So Norway is looking like an early game for military and expansion. Powerful early navies and the berserkers get you quite a stronghold, and also has a decent religion game. After the early game you could continue towards domination, or use that early power to set up a transition into another victory condition. And then we have the Roman Empire under Trajan. The leader bonus here is Trajan's Column, where new cities start with a free building. Usually it's going to be a monument, but in some cases it'll be something else. The permanent civilization bonus here is All Roads Lead to Rome, where all cities start with a trading post and trade routes passing through them earn additional gold. New cities within trade route range of the capital start with a road to it as well. The Legion is a unique unit here replacing the Swordsman. It functions as a military engineer and can build roads and the Roman fort, which gives bonus defensive strength and fortification bonuses to the occupying unit. It has limited charges like a builder though. And the Bath District is a unique infrastructure providing amenities and more housing than the normal aqueduct, which it replaces. We also know Trajan's agenda is Optimus Princeps, and tries to include as much territory as possible in his empire and does not like civilizations who control very little territory. So Rome's looking like an early to mid game Civ with strong military and growth bonuses for cities specifically. The way I see playing Rome is to expand, defend, solidify and expand again. Next up is the Russian Empire under Peter the Great. His leader bonus is Grand Embassy, giving science and culture from trade routes to civilizations more advanced than Russia. The permanent civilization bonus is Mother Russia. Cities gain extra tiles when founded, also getting bonus faith and production from Tundra tiles. The Cossack is the unique unit for Russia, replacing cavalry and can move after attacking. And the Lavra district is the unique infrastructure here, replacing the holy site. 
and the city will grow by one tile each time a great person is used in a city with a lavra. So Rush is looking like a mid to late game sieve, but an early territory grab could be very good. The extra territory you get from founding new cities is crazy expansionist. And the great person bonus of adding an extra tile just expands your territory even more. Though overexpanding can take a toll on your civilization, so those trade routes to make sure you don't get left behind are gonna be important. And then we have the Scythian Empire under Tomiris. The leader bonus here is Killer of Cyrus, and all units receive bonus combat strength when attacking wounded units. When they eliminate a unit, they heal up to 50 points. The permanent civilization bonus is People of the Steppe, where you receive a second Light Cavalry Osaka Horse Archer unit each time you train a Light Cavalry Osaka Horse Archer. Basically, train one, get two and that Saka Horse Archer is the Scythian unique unit. It's an early game fast ranged unit, and it doesn't require horses to train. And the Kurgan Tile Improvement is a unique infrastructure providing faith and gold, and receives an adjacency bonus from pastures. It can't be built on a hill or adjacent to other Kurgans. We also know Tomiris's agenda is backstab averse, liking civilizations that are declared friends, and hates civilizations who backstab and declare surprise wars. Scythia is obviously an early game sieve here, with one of the strongest early militaries possible with the double units healing and wiping out wounded units. Kurgans keep your sieve going early on, and you have to set up an empire that can maintain momentum through the mid game. If you don't take advantage of the early military, you'll fall really behind if you're playing Scythia. Then we have the Spanish Empire under Philip II. The leader bonus here is El Escorial, where you get combat bonuses versus units of factions following other religions, and Inquisitors have one extra remove heresy charge. The permanent civilization bonus here is treasure fleets. Trade routes between continents gives additional yields, and you can combine ships into fleets. The Conquistador is the unique Spanish unit here, replacing the Musketman, getting bonus combat strength when stacked with an Apostle, Inquisitor, or Missionary. And if a Conquistador is adjacent to a city when captured, it converts that city to Spain's majority religion. The Mission Improvement is a unique infrastructure providing faith, and increased faith when built on a foreign continent, and bonus science when built adjacent to a campus district. We also know Philip II's agenda is counter-reformer, liking civilizations who follow the same religion and wants his city to all follow the same religion, hates anyone trying to spread their religion into his empire. So Spain's looking very much like a mid-game sieve, trade, culture, and religion, super aligned to a religious victory including tying military together with religion. The way I see playing Spain is to spread around the world once you're strong enough with some good trade routes going, to spread your religion, kill opposing religions, and just keep spreading. And finally we have the Sumerian Empire under Gilgamesh. The leader bonus here is Adventures with Enkidu. When fighting a joint war, Sumerian units share pillage rewards and combat experience with the nearest allied unit within five tiles. The permanent civilization bonus here is Epic Quest, where clearing out a barbarian camp also grants a tribal village reward. The war cart is a Sumerian unique unit, available at the start of the game, suffers no penalty against spearmen or other anti-cavalry units, and gains extra movement if starting on open terrain. And the ziggurat tile improvement is the unique infrastructure providing science and culture when adjacent to a river, and can't be built on a hill. Sumeria is another obvious early game civilization with a strong early military with ziggurats to keep the sieve going. The way I see playing Sumeria is to establish a strong start and it's important to ally with someone before reaching the mid game. Otherwise, once all your bonuses run out, you might be left high and dry by yourself. Alright, and those are the 19 civilizations in Civ 6 that are launching with the game. Which Civ is your favorite so far? Which one are you gonna play first? And also, which Civ do you think will be the first one added in the next DLC? The Aztecs are technically the first DLC and they'll be available to everyone in January 2017, but I'm hoping for something from the Southeast Asian region, like the Majapahit Empire or Siam again. Also, if you're looking for more Civ 6 videos, I've got two interesting ones for you. The last one was on eras and ages through Civ 6, where I talk about the different eras and what changes between them. And then I have another one on the five victory conditions of Civ 6. Looking at all these civilizations, you might want to know how to win. I also release a new Civilization 6 video every Friday, so subscribe if you'd like to see what else I have in the works. And that's it from me, my name's been GamerZack, thank you so much for watching, hope you enjoyed the video and found it useful, and I'll see you in the next video.